David Bartosz, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very honored to be with you. China, Europe, two distinctive and great civilizations. The interactions between the two dated back much earlier than well-documented Marco Polo's trip to China, isn't it? Yes, uh, European-Chinese uh, relations actually, as far as we know, uh, date back even 2,200 years uh, ago, uh, namely when uh, people of Greek descent uh, in the region of today's Tajikistan uh, um, made their way to China to met uh, Han Dynasty Chinese envoys in uh, approximately around 200 BCE. The Greco-Bactrian king Euthydemus sent his delegation uh, to meet with um, Chinese envoys. And I think this is the starting point, I would say, of European um, or European cultural uh, and Chinese cultural diplomacy. For example, what comes to mind, uh, the city of Trier, the birthplace of Karl Marx, um, is also known for, um, for uh, an artifact a, a piece of clothing which is made of silk and it dates back uh, as far as I know to the third century CE and uh, the material it is made of is is from China most probably so it's made of silk and it's a kind also of a symbol for the trade relations that uh, were um, uh, yeah, going on around that time uh, late antiquity mm -hmm. uh, the established routes between the Chinese and the uh, empire and the Roman empire at the time. And right. so these, these are two examples for the early European Chinese relations and there are plenty more for later times. Yeah, well, there are so many examples of that, which is uh, actually very exciting to compare notes. On the other hand, it is not just about people to people interaction. It is also about philosophical, it's also about ideas. If I understand right, both Confucius and Aristotle representative in a way of uh, the Chinese and the European civilizations have something uh, similar uh, in many concepts. Maybe I'll let, let you to have the examples. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many, many, uh, uh, ex there have been many, many exchanges uh, of thoughts uh, uh, on uh, in both directions. So uh, we might uh, call this whole um, development we, we think of we might think of this whole development as a great learning cycle, as I would like mm -hmm. to put it. For example, um, Chinese ideas uh, of uh, economical organization have been transferred uh, to Germ uh, to uh, yeah to Germany, but also to Europe, uh, to France um, uh, during uh, the time of the uh, European Enlightenment. Um, we know that, uh, for example, the French economist economist. Francois Quesnay, who was called the uh, French Confucius at the time, uh, very much <laughs> absorbed. Yeah, this was his nickname in, in European academic circles. He very much absorbed ideas. Uh, for example, uh, the idea that one should not interfere in the economic processes too much. Uh, one should not uh, interfere in the self-regulation of the markets. Uh, he coined the term laissez-faire, which actually turns out to be a loose translation of the Chinese uh, Wu Wei concept. Mm. Uh, uh, there are um, many more examples, uh, for example, in the context of moral philosophy, Leibniz, and also his uh, student Christian Wolf in Germany, they very much absorbed Confucian ideas. And this became also the starting point uh, or the um, or a great inspiration for the further development of German philosophy. And actually, also implicitly, uh, we find uh, many ideas that made their way into famous philosophy books. For example, Hegel's philosophy of right is not directly referring to Chinese um, concepts. But if you read it, you, you, you become aware that some of these uh, concepts that have been um, uh, yeah, included in the in the ideas of political uh, state of state administration and political forms uh, in the century prior mm. have also uh, in, in which are related to chinese uh, context have been uh, expressed in hegel's philosophy for example and this is mm. really really interesting and at the same time of course karl marx for example has studied Quesnay, this uh, french first economist 
and uh, later ideas of Karl Marx have found their way to China and have mm. absorbed in a um, context uh, of uh, scholarship which ha has been deeply um, influenced by Confucian Daoist uh, backgrounds. So, so there is um, actually a great learning circle going on between Europe and China uh, for many centuries also in the context of philosophy. Mm. This uh, learning spiral, I remember you were talking to me earlier uh, using this phrase, is extremely interesting because if you think about the Chinese and the uh, European civilization, it's very different from one another to begin with. And of course, even today, uh, what actually could be able to brought these two together and why they are so enticed by being inspired by the other? I think, first of all, uh, we uh, should not think about differences in a negative way. I think uh, to call something different um, is uh, also implies that there is an underlying unity. There's some kind of thing that allows us to uh, to differentiate on that basis. So there, there must be very fundamental touch points in play to be able to see these differences. And uh, furthermore, I think um, to have uh, yeah, two different points of seeing the world is an enrichment, I think, for, for both sides, because we can uh, learn from each other, we can absorb what is useful for our context, and also uh, learn about the other in a more profound way, because we can differentiate um, it against the background of our own uh, horizon of understanding. and. Mm -hmm. Understanding the English word, um, this this uh, first part of the word under actually uh, goes back to a word root that is also uh, the word root of the word inter in international or intercultural or interdisciplinary. So actually mm -hmm. understanding uh, literally taken, it, it means to stand amongst or to stand in between. So to connect two different sides and then to acquire a better understanding. Uh, so yeah. uh, in a sense, um, I th think uh, it is really, really fruitful to study both civilizations. If you think about the year, we are already 2022. Uh, after all, at this point, to a certain extent, a little bit afraid of the other. Uh, or shall we say that why after almost 2000 years that we, unlike our ancestors, who are more open-minded, it seems, at least in history record, uh, that we are so much scared by people or by ideas that are different from ours. Mm -hmm. As a philosopher, how do you see this phenomenon? Mm. I think it is Im very important that we uh, remind ourselves in, in all regions of the world that we remind ourselves that we as human beings, we are a ubiqu ubiquitous species. And we always have been a ubiquitous species. That means uh, this process that we call globalization, it did not just start in the 20th century. Uh, even Neolithic people, they have exchanged technologies, they have exchanged uh, goods, over vast spaces throughout the whole of Eurasia, as we now know, and uh, uh, the ancient empires of, of the Indus River Valley and, and uh, Mesopotamia, they, they were trading already. They had, even, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, they had even commensurable measurements in play to, to, per, to, um, yeah, to have a, a common system of trade. So um, this is actually our, our being together, our, our uh, shared economy, our shared future, in a sense, is actually also a very ancient uh, uh, reality. And we, mm. we just have to remind ourselves of the fact. And I mean, maybe some people are a little bit afraid uh, because um, we, especially in Europe or in the West in general, uh, we, we might have, uh, we were very successful. Our civilization was very successful for, uh, for approximately 200 years in terms of technology and scientific progress. And during that phase, uh, we have forgotten that most of the input for the success has been acquired from, from elsewhere, right? Uh, for example, the Western hospital system has not been invented in, in Europe. It has actually been invented in pre-Islamic Iran. Uh, 
in, in the last Persian uh, dynasty, Sasanian dynasty, where um, these doctors in Western Asia, they, they, they fuse Chinese medicine with Greek medicine and the uh, Iranian uh, ancient traditional medicine traditions, right? And then mm -hmm. these, these ideas were later transferred uh, to Europe via uh, the uh, yeah, books written in Arabic and, and then found a way to were translated into Latin. And uh, a lot right. of words that we use, even in our everyday language, in, in German, uh, the word T is uh, T, which is actually um, acquired right. from Fujianhua, from, from South China, uh, th South Chinese dialect, dialect uh, the word for tea is de. And the list goes on, isn't it? Goes on and, and vice versa. And uh, Greek sculpture over many centuries found its way via the Silk Road to, to China and transformed into Buddhist, uh, Chinese Buddhist uh, forms of sculpture. The list goes on, science, philosophy, also the Chinese modern mm -hmm. um, uh, university system is so much influenced mm. by the Western university system. So you are saying that globalization did not just happen over the past few decades. Actually, it's been happening throughout our human history. And we better should be aware of that. Uh, I think all the great works of art, all the great um, achievements in sciences, in, in philosophy, uh, throughout the world in many civilizations and cultures, they point at a possible better future for humanity. But we have to, uh, we have to see uh, this promise in, in all of these traditions. We have to be aware of our, the backgrounds that we are born into, that our, our parents and grandparents uh, are, are stemming from. But we also have to embrace um, the other traditions and all these traditions, they, they have the same foundation. And the difference is our advantage, I would say, because it enables us to acquire new ideas and also to see ourselves in a new light, to interpret ourselves in a new light. Um, mm. A very important point also in the future of uh, these current technological developments with artificial intelligence and, and uh, many um, other things going on, I think we have to nurture our creativity as humanity uh, mm -hmm. to the pace with these developments, but also to, um, to nurture these developments, these structures, this new upcoming yeah. infrastructure. And therefore, there's no other way than to push uh, and, and to suppress our own fear, in a sense, and to overcome our fear. For example, these days, as uh many Confucian scholars around the world are studying the thoughts of Confucianism. Uh, the earlier translation that is focusing on finding an equivalent concept in Western civilization to match that uh, of uh, the Confucius thought actually has failed us to understand with in-depth knowledge about the uh, inner meanings of Confucianism. And that's why many scholars are trying to uh, inform the public that one has to understand terminologies in Chinese Confucianism, for example, uh, from its own very root, rather than just finding an equivalent Western English word. So that's only one example. How do you see what this phenomenon mean? You know, how is that uh, going to help us to understand, when we try to understand the other civilization, the other cultures, how much in-depth we need to go into and how patient we need to be, how sincere we need to be. What is fascinating about our time is that actually it is the first time in world history that Chinese people are introducing their own culture uh, in a, in a very um, direct and broad sense uh, to a European um, community. Of course, we, we know that maybe the fleet, uh, some members of uh, the expedition of Zheng He might have found their way to Italy in the 15th century, but these were just short episodes. But actually, and later uh, Chinese culture was always introduced uh, through the lens or the filter of the, the Jesuits. Uh, uh, missionaries who, who were in China and were sending letters and books back to France announced the first time that 
Chinese people themselves are introducing their culture to the world. This is actually also very important, I would say, world historical uh, event and undertaking. And it is not easy, um, but it's 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 feasible. Uh, but it's true. We have to go to to the roots of the words, the roots of the concepts, and then we have to compare. That's important. We have to also compare. Uh, but the same. Uh, holds true with other civilizations. I think of mm -hmm. African, ancient African languages. It is so fascinating to, if, if we can find out what, what the original meaning of human is in a particular African language, well, or what is the original uh, meaning of the way, the Tao in China, mm -hmm. right? All of these um, original root meanings or root concepts can be right. And I think this is this is one part of the story that's very important. But of course, we also have to look at the current, the current unfoldments of these civilizations, their modernities, their different modernities. So it's a very complex um, a task to master. And it's, of course, we can only master it together. No one uh, could uh, put this task on their shoulders. You say something very interesting to me that this might be the very first time in history for centuries that the Chinese will be able to uh, introduce their own cultures to the rest of the world. Uh, how do you see this process going on so far? It's only starting, it seems. It is only starting. And as I said, it is also not just the task of one side, right? So. Uh, there, there are great scholars uh, in, in Europe, great sinologists. There is a great tradition also in philosophy of thinkers who were open to Chinese thought. Think of Karl Jaspers, for example. Um, uh, so, so I think we have to bring together the two sides. And uh, also the Chinese uh, side, uh, of course, has undergone a process of modernization. Uh, uh, over the over the over the, during the twentieth century in particular, uh, where the, um, uh, the 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 system of academics and science has has been uh, changed has changed and also westernized so to speak. So also the the awareness it's important even for Chinese experts to to become really aware of the difference between their traditions and maybe the modern interpretations with with uh, the tools that are acquired uh, in a context, a, a global university mm -hmm. academic uh, context, which, which have other, other backgrounds in Western science. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these things are very, very complicated, but, they are, but the whole process, I think, uh, can be very, yeah. very fruitful. And we, we just have to, we have to um, put effort into it. I'm putting a lot of effort into a comparison for example, and also in uh, partly in, in into digging historical uh, field in, in historical fields like an archaeologist, but also to compare systematically. For example, a Greek philosophy, uh, Plotinus, for example, a great Greek philosopher with Wang Yangming, uh, or uh, also recently, um, I, I I found a text, uh, mm -hmm. a translation from. Uh, um, uh, Manzu, uh, so from the uh, Manchu, Man, Manchu language uh, into German, a text which was translated in 1840. Uh, and uh, this uh, tra Manzu translation was already a, a translation itself. So it, it's been a text translated from Chinese into Manzu into German. But then I found that the, the author of the Chinese text was a European. <laughs> when you are saying your research about Wang Yangming and uh, also uh, the uh, European uh, philosophy. Can you give us one example of the recent research you are doing? Um, yeah, recently uh, I'm uh, also I have developed uh, a perspective on the very logical foundations uh, that I would say all the great thinkers in various civilizations actually do share. Right, um, so uh, I, I call this uh, the implicate logic. This is my term for it. Um, it can be found in, uh, for example, in Lao Tzu, in the, in the first stanza of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, uh, it can be found in Greek philosophy, in, uh, uh, in Indian traditions, even in Mesoamerican traditions. So the comparison is extremely interesting. I would like to throw an example as well. 
about uh, trustworthiness. We heard uh, philosophers like Confucius and philosophers like Aristotle having similar ideas. Confucius saying, if one is trustworthy, others will give one responsibility. Aristotle, we become just by practicing justice, truthful by practicing truthfulness, and honesty, courageous by practicing courage unless it becomes a habit, unless these virtues become an extension of ourselves. So those are the things that learned a little bit before talking to you, David, but certainly this kind of comparison is absolutely fascinating. Yes, yes, yes. It's wonderful because we can uh, find uh, ideas that uh, have been nurtured in our civilizational uh, societal foundations in other uh, contexts, other systems, other civilizations, of, uh, other uh, societies as well. So we, we can we can um, appreciate uh, the mm. shared uh, foundations of a true humanity, which has been voiced and expressed in different languages, in different um, contexts of, of other right. uh, traditions and, and uh, so, uh, subsystems of these societies. Yet it, there are very fundamental ideas that, that we share. And Aristotle is a very good example because he also said that the human being is... Um, yeah, we might best put it uh, a pol he, uh, politically he, politically living being, he said, but he, what he meant was uh, that the human being is a social, uh, socially living yes. being. This is exactly okay. what Confucius has emphasized. There are many more um, parallels between Greek thinkers, also others like Heraclitus of Ephesus, who, who, who compared, who has compared uh, the, um, the world to a river, which is which is flowing uh, endlessly and and confucius also has mm. expressed very similar ideas you you talk about one thing which i think is very worthwhile to touch on as well that is today david as you know we have information flow faster than any previous time one could argue and also we have the transportation system such as the you know the china going to europe uh, highway uh the, the train service, yeah, China-Europe train. So that's, that is taking all of us ever closer to one another. So how are we, with all of these modern conveniences, would be able to better understand each other rather than uh, being exclusive? Uh, that is a big question, I guess, facing philosophers like you and many of us in these different uh, civilizations. Yeah, we, we should uh, try not to be carried away by all these uh, technological developments and all this huge amount of information and possible uh, ways to, to look at things. Uh, we should rather, again, we should, we should try to remind ourselves of the thousands of years of history, which is now available due to these technological uh, gadgets and, 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 and the internet. Um, because uh, I think to master our future, to to develop a a long term, uh, long standing existence of humanity mm -hmm. on this planet, uh, we we have to master and we have to know the ideas of the past. For example, yes, we think about ecological civilization. Uh, there are so many wonderful ideas to be found in Chinese tradition about the empathy empathy with other life forms in, in a Chinese Buddhism, but also in Chinese Confucian traditions, Wang Yangming emphasized the empathy with animals and plants. And we find the same idea, for example, in, in the um, uh, late um, uh, Greek um, uh, philosopher Plotinus, uh, who also emphasized that even plants uh, participate in, in a certain form of very rudimentary consciousness plants have a striving to live right that's what we as humans we share with the plants is this striving we, we want to live we want to continue our lives uh, mm. uh, and, and uh, so there is a, a connection of all life on this planet and uh, already the ancient thinkers in various civilizations independently of each other have have emphasized 
um, this idea, which now is reemerging right. in the context of ecological thinking uh, in, in various uh, schemes and books and formats. And I, I think this is all very helpful. And in, in the German tradition, for example, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the famous uh, poet and writer uh, and philosopher, he, he said one has to acquire an understanding of at least 3,000 years of history to be able to master the future. And I think this idea is very Confucian. <laughs> David Bartosz, as always, thank you. Thank you very much.